Hey. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, folks. Um, my name is Brendan Vanis. Oh, sorry, let's go back. My name is Brendan Vanis. I am the uh, Senior Developer Success Engineer for PlayFab. You can think of me as being your uh, technical representative for all things PlayFab. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about the catalog and store systems in PlayFab, giving you a little bit more of a thorough walkthrough so that you get an idea of how to use it and what the capabilities are. Um, as always, we will have the, uh, the questions box open, so if you have any questions throughout our talk today, feel free to enter them in there, and we'll get you the information you need. Okay, so let's dive right on in. <coughs> so today, waiting for the screen to update, there we go, um, going to talk about virtual current software, since that's the, the foundation of your online economy, and then I'm going to dive into the game catalog itself. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you set up the game catalog and how we've designed it, what the game catalog version is for, uh, how to add items, sell them, grant them to players, and then we'll go through uh, a walkthrough of all the different item types and usage models for items in the catalog, and we'll talk about custom data on inventory items, both those at the catalog level and at the inventory item instance level on the player. Then we'll talk about stores, which once we've covered everything in the catalog, the stores will be pretty straightforward. Uh, and then finally, there are some resources that uh, I'll have a page of at the end of this so that you can uh, read more in our blog uh, or in our GitHub project about some of the things we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> okay. And the, uh, the special additional challenge today is that this is going to be a little bit of a live demo. Now, mostly for the webinars, apart from our office hours talks, uh, we haven't been doing live demos because, of course, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, everything. Um, as you've probably seen, if you've been in this industry a while, live demos, you know, they frequently may trip us up, So, but uh, we're going to go for it anyway, and we'll, uh, we'll dive right in and show you uh, setting up the, uh, the various items in the catalog directly so that you can see in the game manager what the steps are that you would actually take to do this. Okay. So starting off, virtual currencies. Uh, for any game system where you have a catalog, you're either going to be doing solely real money purchases or real money purchases plus uh, virtual currency or maybe just a virtual currency. Uh, in this case, we're going to go in, in depth on both virtual currency and uh, real currency setup and how you would use those in our system to make sure that you get the, the complete picture of it. So I've got the picture there of the economy with the uh, the currency showing, but now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead, if I can get to the correct screen, there we go, right there. The uh, And if it'll just let me do it, there we go. Okay, so here's the title that I've created for the purposes of demonstrating everything to you today. I'm going to go to the economy tab first. And within the economy tab, I'm going to go to the currencies. Okay, clean slate. So first things first, let's add in a, a virtual currency, which is just going to be your standard gold coin types of currency. Okay, gold coins. And we're going to give players, say, 100 of these to start off with. This way that the players have a currency that they will be able to uh, go into your catalog and make a purchase get a taste of what that's like so that they know, you know, they want more gold coins later, they want to be able to spend more money later on. Okay. Now let's add in one. Let's call them diamonds. Now diamonds are your hard currency, so the soft and the hard currency. In the case of diamonds, it's something that you only ever give to the player uh, by very rare in-game events or by purchases that the player makes. So the diamond is the special currency. And let's say you're going to give the player maybe five of these to start with. Okay. But then, finally, you also have a time-based currency that you want to use. Uh, because you're going to want to have the players only be able to take a certain number of moves per day, for instance. So let's just call those hearts. And the player starts off with five of them. They regenerate once every hour, so you'd enter that as 24 units per day, and the recharge max is five. So the design here is this is now a virtual currency which regenerates. 
Uh, the player starts out with five. Whenever he drops below five, it regenerates at a rate of once an hour, but the limit that the player can go up to is five. So once it reaches that five, it will not regenerate any higher. Um, you can, through the uh, add user virtual currency call or through the game manager, add extra currency to a player beyond that five. So this isn't a hard limit to the currency, it's just a regeneration limit. Also, I need to point out that the recharge rate on a currency can be set to a negative number. So, for example, if you had some currency where the player is time limited on using it, uh, obviously you'd probably start out with an initial deposit of zero, but if you set the recharge rate to negative 24, then it would subtract one every hour. So if it was something where you're giving the player uh, five uses of something, but you really want them to be encouraged to, to use it right away, you just set it to negative 24. Uh, you would set the recharge max just to zero, because obviously you're not going to want it to go to a negative number. And off you go. Okay, but for the purposes of this game, we've got our gold coins, our diamonds, and our hearts. So now I'm going to save that. Okay, and it is saved. So let's go back to the talk now. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so we've added our virtual currency. So how do you grant virtual currencies to players? So there's two ways to do it, uh, one of which is using one of our API calls. Uh, so there are API calls both on the server and on the client, which allow you to add virtual currency to a player. Note, however, that we don't trust the client by and large. So if I go back, oops, excuse me, if I go back to our title and I go into settings, I go into general for our settings, you'll note over here under enable, disable API features, allow client to add virtual currency, allow client to subtract virtual currency. These are always off by default for titles in PlayFab. The reason being we don't trust the client. If you give the client the ability to add and subtract virtual currency, then it is entirely possible that a hacked client could submit the add subtract calls to you in ways that you don't expect. So a player could add virtual currency to their heart's content. Now, there are certain game types where this is really not relevant. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if the player cheats it because all you care about is the player being in the game and playing, and if they want to cheat, that's all fine and dandy. A game that has no competitive aspect, no leaderboards, where your revenue maybe is being driven on advertisements. That's a great example. So it's totally valid <clears throat> excuse me, for a class of titles, but in general, we don't trust the client. Okay. So <clears throat> most titles, rather than using the uh, client API, will want to use CloudScript. If you have a game server of your own, one where you uh, have the players connecting to a session-based server, maybe hosted in PlayFab, then the server could make the API calls. But otherwise, CloudScript is the way you want to go. We have an example in our GitHub, and again, I'll give you the link to our GitHub at the end of the talk. Um, the, uh, the example is in the CloudScript samples GitHub, and the specific directory for it is rewards. There's a JavaScript file in there, which you can upload to your game in PlayFab, <clears throat> and you can use that to experiment with doing rewards. You'll want to obviously set up the currency and the inventory items as shown in that file, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward to use. The code snippet that I've provided here shows you specifically from that script the section where a virtual currency is added to a player's account. And in this case what it is is <clears throat> when you've killed a monster in the game, uh, we're checking the currency value in the defined kill reward. Uh, kill reward could be defined in title data or it could be defined in the header of the JavaScript file for your cloud script. But you find the appropriate kill reward for the creature that's been killed and you go ahead and add the virtual currency to the player. Uh, the reset kill timer, I'm just leaving that in there so that you see this is the mechanism that this particular cloud script is using as uh, one of the protections. So the reason you put this in cloud script is so that you have server authority over the operation you record, in this case, the time that the last kill occurred. So the next time this cloud script gets called, you can check that time and say, <clears throat> is it reasonable that the player could have killed another creature in the amount of time given? So that if someone 
writes a, you know, uses a hack client and writes a script that causes it to send a kill every second, you can catch that easily. Okay, moving on from there, the game catalog. Okay. So <clears throat> the reason we chose to go with catalog version for the game is that the, the design of the system, the, the intent, is that all the items for your catalog are in one catalog. All the items for your game are in one catalog. Um, the simple, simply put, the idea is that any version of your game is one-to-one -one associated with a single catalog containing all items. The store, which we'll talk about later, is the way to subdivide the catalog so that you can have more convenient sets. We do also have the item types and tags in the catalog, which we will later on be providing additional functionality for filtering on. <clears throat> but using one game catalog means that you have the ability to then uh, provide for multiple game versions. Uh, the item IDs can be reused, reused or not as you need. And in the example I'm showing here, your shipping game, so game version 1.0, you have some items. I'm just listing items A and B at the moment. And then over the course of development, your next release of the game, version 1.1, you've added more items, so item C in this example. So these are distinct catalogs with their own distinct catalog versions in our system. Maybe then in game version 2.0, so a much later update and a much broader update to your game, you're completely changing out your items and their X, Y, and Z. This is fine. All of these catalogs continue to exist in your system. And all of the items in the player's inventory reference the catalogs they came from. So one way to look at this is uh, the items that were in ABC in game version one, these are now items that only your original players could possibly have. So it's something about a badge of honor in, in, in some games where people say, oh, well, I've got this item because, hey, you know, you can't get it anymore. You just can't get this item anymore. Um, and that then could become something valuable that people might give a premium for in your game for trading it away from another player. And we'll talk about trading in just a bit. Um, but yes, again, catalog version, all the items for your game in one place. The reason I'm highlighting this is just because uh, we've seen a number of people create multiple catalogs in order to spread their items out across all the different catalogs in their game. Uh, it, it does create something of a, uh, an awkward situation for those developers later when they realize that they have to then replicate all those catalogs in ways that uh, sort of aren't how the system was originally designed for their subsequent game releases. Okay, so adding items. Uh, you can use the admin API calls to set the items up in your game. And this is an example of doing that below. It's an API call, set catalog items. All of these are admin API calls, and you use it to set up an item in the catalog. But like I said, live demo, we're going to go back over to our catalog here, to our economy. I'm going to set up some items for you in real time so that you can see exactly what the steps are that you would take. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a catalog. And I'm just going to call it one. So we create that catalog. <clears throat> Okay, that catalog now exists. Now you notice up here, set as primary. There's a number of uh, pieces of functionality in our service, which when you call into them, and it's all concerning the catalog, if you don't specify the catalog version, it uses the primary. So in general, you will want to set the title as your primary, the title's primary catalog for your release and for subsequent updates. Okay, so let's add an item. There we go. So the item interface <clears throat> gives you all the pieces that you need to set up an item uh, without using the API calls. So let's set up an item here. I'm going to give it the item ID of something. And uh, if you want to use class, you know, we'll, we'll say that something is an item of type thing. And it's got a tag of, oh, I don't know, let's say it's a red item. And maybe it's large. Okay. And the display name and the description are useful items that you can use for your game to have some text that they can pull in. Oops, and typos are my thing. There we go. Um, obviously, we don't have a localization system built into PlayFab yet. That is something that we will be building in in, a, in an upcoming update. 
but for right now, this is how you would set things up. So uh, you add in your dis display name, description, and then you can use them in your game. Okay. So over on the right, you can see that we have all the items concerning the consumables. I'll show you that in a minute. And then on the left, we have stackable and tradable. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. But first, let's go to attributes. I'm going to set a couple of attributes on this item. So let's add an attribute. And it's got a key of, let's say, icon is thing. Oops. And one of the ways in which you could use your attributes on your item, and it has a strength of 10. There we go. One of the ways that you can use the attributes on the item is you can use them to define these, there we go, values which are then used by other systems that you've integrated into your game. In this case, I'm saying the icon is thing. So when you pull the, pull the item down, you get that from the catalog. That would allow you to, for example, call into a CDN. Uh, and we do have a CDN in our service. If you look at the content API calls in our uh, web API documentation, you'll see how to use that. Uh, so you could look up this icon thing, and it would then be maybe a thing PNG in your CDN. You'd have that built into your game so that you know to look up the, uh, the item's uh, actual visual icon in the CDN using that standard mechanism. So that way, whenever you added items into your game, you could just add in all the attributes that you need and have it be a completely data-driven system so that you don't need to update your game in order to ship new items out to it. Okay, so I'm going to save these two out. Oops. We'll talk about bundles and containers later. But let's add a price to this item for now. So you'll note there's one additional currency here which did not was not one that I created on the list, and that's real money. Real money is specifically that. Um, it's the amount of money in pennies. I'm going to say one dollar ninety nine cents. So one nine nine. Um, it's the amount of uh, money in U.S. dollars pennies that the item costs, and that's useful to you for your reporting, but it's also something that you're going to use whenever you do a payment using a payment provider. And I'll talk about payment providers in a bit too, but let's add another virtual currency for now. Okay. So this is something where you want people to be able to buy it for real money, or let's say you want people to be able to buy it for that 100 coins that we gave them to start with, or the rarer diamonds. Oops. There we go. So we'll take one of your diamonds. So what I've done here is I've created an item <coughs> that has three separate currencies that can be used to purchase it. Real money, gold coins, or diamonds. Now it does not take all three to purchase it. Each of these is distinct. So any one of these is valid for the purchase operation. So the player could make a purchase using gold coins, diamonds, or real money. Okay. So that's one item that we've set up. And let me go back to the talk now. There we go. So you can see that this is basically the idea. Obviously, I gave it a different description, but that's the basic idea of how you set up items in your catalog. Uh, setting them up using the APIs is actually very useful. I mean, for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I'm going to show it all to you in the game manager so that you see all the steps. But if you set up your catalog using the API calls, the nice thing about that is you can make it part of your build process. That way, as you update your catalog, it's just automatically being updated for you every time you make a build. And uh, since at the moment we use one development and, and development test and live environment. So basically, your title exists in one environment. When you ship your game live, you're in the same environment at the moment. We'll have a sandbox environment later on, but for right now, they are in one. So the recommendation is have your test title be separate from your live title so that you can create your title, iterate on it, and then when you're ready, in your build process, swap the title ID to your live title so that everything's pointed there and it updates in the build process. Okay. And you can see, again, consumables, stackable, tradable. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But first, let's talk about selling items. So there are really three distinct ways to sell items to players. Uh, and two of them are very similar, the first two. Receipt validation is something that we do on the iOS, Android, and Amazon platforms. And in those platforms, what it is, is there's a receipt that you get 
from the payment provider, let's say iTunes in this case. So you get the receipt from iTunes and you pass the receipt up to us using an API call, which is receipt, which is receipt validation. You can find it in our uh, client API set in the documentation. When you make that call to us, what happens is, is we take the receipt, make sure that it has never been used before, since one of the most common attacks is replay attack, where someone takes a receipt and they send it up again and again and again in order to get the same item over and over again. So we make sure that doesn't happen. We check with Apple to make sure that the receipt is actually valid. Uh, but one of the most common attacks is a submission of a receipt which is valid, but it isn't one that the player used, it isn't one the player purchased, and it isn't even from your game. Um, if you've uh, ever seen this before, what you've probably seen is that there is a common hack that exists in the wild where uh, people substitute the receipt, and the receipt you'll see most often is one from an old cut the rope game. Um, that receipt is perfectly valid as far as Apple is concerned, so the Apple verify receipt call will always return true. Problem is, of course, you're not making any money on it at all because it has nothing whatsoever to do for your game with your game and the player in question. So in addition to checking that the receipt is actually valid, we also check that it is correct for your game and that it contains an item which is from your catalog. When you set up your catalog of goods in the iTunes store, what you'll do is you'll set them up with a product ID, and the same is also true of the Google store. Um, that product ID is in a string which needs to match the item ID of the item that you set up in our catalog. So you saw me set up the item, or the item ID a minute ago was something. So you would have an item in the iTunes catalog where the name is also something. That matches it up one to one. The receipt gives us the information about that item that lets us find it in the catalog, create an instance of it, and put it in the player's inventory. So it's an end-to-end -end process that all gets kicked off by the receipt to us. And it makes sure that the player cannot cheat, he, he cannot get items he didn't pay for, and he'll always get the items that he sends receipts to us for. Uh, in the case where there's a disconnect, where the player doesn't manage to send the receipt to us, uh, where there's a, an internet connection failure, something along those lines, uh, there's also the ability to resend us the, the receipt later, uh, which is not a problem because, as I said, we checked that the receipt hasn't been used already. And in, at least in the case of Apple, there's also a requirement that you are able to do a refresh of all of the items for the player. The intent being that if the player loses their iPhone, for example, and they get a new one, well, that new device has a new device ID. So if the only login that the player was using was device ID, they're not connected to the same account anymore. Uh, note that if you use our recommended login process, and we have a, a post on that in our blog, um, the idea is, yes, you use device ID to start off with so that you have a zero friction sign-in, but then later you add in additional claims like Facebook or your Google profile. <clears throat> that allows you to then use those later to sign back into the same account from different devices. So in the case of someone losing their device, they could then sign back in again using Facebook to the original account that they had, and therefore they won't have lost anything. They'll have all their statistics, all their data, all their items. But let's say for purposes of, for sake of argument, that hasn't been done. The player signed in using the zero friction device ID but never added any other claims. Okay, he loses his device, he gets a new one. There's a call that you make to Apple to, that gets you what's called a refresh receipt, and that contains all the receipts that the player ever used previously. And you can pass that up to us. We take care of fulfilling all of the items within it which are durable good purchases, which is what the Apple requirement is. <clears throat> Now, similar to receipt validation is entitlement checks, and entitlement checks are specific to the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live. In those environments, you have a catalog set up, and when a player purchases something, the, uh, the item is made part of the player profile in their environment. They provide what they call entitlement checks. Really, from our perspective, it's very, very similar to receipt, because in the context of PlayFab, you give us the entitlement check, and we perform the same actions. We make sure it's valid, make sure it's associated with an item in your catalog, and we add that item then into the player inventory as an instance. Okay, but the really interesting part is when you don't have either of those systems, and that's when you have a payment provider that you need to work with. And <clears throat> now it's a catalog and cart-like experience. So in this context, 
uh, the player has a listing of items that they're choosing from. They select items, and they put them in their cart, and then they select purchase, and then they said purchase confirmation, and then they've got the items. Now, under the covers, those three steps are pretty much exactly how it works. There's an API in the client API set called Start Purchase. Now, that's the one that you call to start this process off, and it creates a cart of goods in our service. That cart contains all the items, and it locks in the prices of those items. So if you happen to be doing an update at the same time someone's doing some shopping in your own in-game catalog, when the player hits Purchase Goods, and then they get their pop-up to pay for those goods, if during the process flow of the player making that purchase, you on the back end change prices, it won't cause the player to then see a price they don't expect when they go to make their payment because they started the purchase with a price, it gets locked in, that's the price that they see, that's the price that they pay as they go through the process. Okay, so in this case, I've started the purchase and I, I put a store in there just for the sake of argument. I'm saying it's the holiday store, so I'll show you the holiday store setup later. But it's our something item. Uh, you don't need to have an annotation, but you can use annotations so that you track on that. The annotations are made part of the event information that you get about any purchase. And what gets returned is on the right. So you get back an order ID and the list of contents for that purchase, and then what your payment options are. So I've only listed a couple of them for this example. Um, I've listed Steam and PayPal. So next step is you want to actually ask the player to pay for those goods. So that's the pay for purchase call. The pay for purchase call then initiates the transaction with the payment provider. So you call to us and you specify the order and the provider that you need to use for that order and what the currency is, in this case, real money. And we return to you the order ID, what its status is, and the purchase currency and price. Now on the back end, what we do is we contact the payment provider and we use their APIs to inform them of this purchase and get it set up for you. If the payment provider is someone like a PayPal, we will be passing back the information needed for you to then uh, create the payment window on the client. However, in the case of Steam, there's actually a Steam application already running. The player's already signed into it. And when we notify Steam that a payment is being requested, they automatically trigger the in-game overlay that asks the player to confirm the payment. Uh, your game needs to be registered to receive the callback and this is all in the Steam documentation, uh, that callback is triggered when the user authorizes the transaction or hits cancel on the transaction and declines it. And once that's done, you then would call into the Confirm Purchase API for uh, PayFab, uh, Play which finalizes the purchase in our environment. Uh, we contact the payment provider and confirm that the purchase was actually made, that the money exchange occurred, once we've confirmed that, then we go ahead and we add the items to the user's inventory, and the return value from us then contains the order ID, when the purchase was made, and any items that were purchased as part of that process. So you get back the information without having to get the user's inventory again of what items were actually added to the player's inventory. The other thing you can do in addition to selling people items is you can also grant them to them. Now, I did cover this uh, in more depth in the Advanced Cloud Script webinar that we had recently, but I'll cover it at a really light level here. Uh, again, in our Cloud Script samples, in the rewards uh, sample that we have in there, we show you how to do grants of items to the users. In this case, we set it up as when the, uh, when the player completed a level, we had level rewards. And the level rewards are, again, defined in that Cloud Script, though, as always, I would say, it's best for you to define it in, in title data, if at all possible, so that you can make adjustments to it more easily on the fly. So in the case of the cloud script, when the player completes the level, we use the server grant items to user call to give the item to the player. And again, uh, you would only want to do grants of items through server-based operations in order to ensure that players can't cheat your system and get items that they don't pay for. Okay, so here's where I'm going to go back to the catalog and I'm going to dive in and show you the rest of the things that you can do. And I've already shown you durables. So the item that we created was what, we, what you would call a durable. It's not consumable in any way. So next I'm going to show you consumables, talk a little bit about stackables, tradables, bundles and containers, and <clears throat> as part of containers and bundles, random drop tables. So here we go. First things first, let's add a consumable item. 
So I'm going to add in here, let's say, a health potion. Oops, sorry, that's my item ID. So let's do it that way. And then I can, for the display name, call it health potion. I'm not going to bother with the item classes and the tags just for the sake of time at this point, but you've already seen how those can be used, and you can certainly use them together with your own tools for doing sorting on uh, your catalog. And again, we will be adding some logic around using those later directly. Now, I've added a usage count of five. There is a specific API, uh, consume item, in the client API set that you would use whenever the player uses that item, and it decrements this usage count every time he uses it. Now I save that item. Okay, so there's a basic consumable item. All right, so what about consumable by time? Let's add one of those. So this is going to be an experience boost. And I did it again. There we go. Let's just call it X boost. Okay. So the experience boost is, let's say, two times experience for, oh, I don't know, how about an hour? One hour. Okay. So that means your usage period is going to be one. Oops, and I've got a webinar window in my way, so there we go. Okay, one hour. There we go. So that sets the item up <clears throat> as having one hour usage period. But there's one special thing about usage period. Uh, well, first let me just explain. This means that when the item is added to the player's inventory, the timer starts. At the end of one hour, real world time, that item will be removed from the player's inventory. But what you could do, you could set up a usage period group here of, let's say, boosts. Okay, so now I've added a usage period group boosts. What's that useful for? Let's add another boost. Catalog item. Oops, I'm sorry. Hit the wrong button. There we go. Add another catalog item. <clears throat> okay, so this one's going to be a super experience boost. All right. And this one's going to be five times experience for one hour. Okay, this one obviously you're going to set up with a much higher price. I won't do the prices right now, but you've already seen how to use that. So again, this item has a period of one hour, and now it has boost as its usage period. So what does that do? Um, what that does is this. Any items which have a matching usage period group have their times added together. So what that means is if, I've, if I'm a player and I've got the experience boost in my inventory, and I'm down to 30 minutes. If another item gets added to my inventory with the same usage period group, so either, in this case, either experience boost or super experience boost, if either one of those is added to my inventory, that usage period for that item, in this case one hour, gets added to both items. So now I've still got the experience boost, now I've got the super experience boost, and there was a half an hour left on the one, I've added an hour for the other one, so now they're both going to stick around for the next hour and a half. So that's a way to extend out the time period on any items that you grant to the player. And it also incentivizes the player, once you've you know, familiarized them with your system, it incentivizes the player to spend your currency on getting these items because they see their times running down on this, and it gives them the option to extend it out and keep those items for a little bit longer. Okay. That's super experience boost. Now let's add, let's say, let's say you've got an item which the player can collect a whole bunch of. Um, oh, I don't know, let's say cards. We actually have a number of, of cards in our service, card, collectible card games being developed in our service, and they're using the, uh, the stackable fairly extensively, so that's what I'm going to be showing you here today, or is this part of it. Um, so I'm just adding a card. It's a playing card. In this particular case, we don't really, you know, the game isn't a collectible card game necessarily, but you get the idea. Okay, so this is a stackable item. So whenever this gets added to the player inventory, it just stacks up onto the same item. 
That way, when you get the player inventory from the service, instead of having a separate entry for every single one of these, you'll just have one entry, and the one entry will have a usage count. Again, it reuses, it reuses the usage count. It will have a usage count of the total number of that item that the player has. And because we're reusing usage count, you can also use the consume item on it. Uh, this is specifically done in order to give you the convenience of being able to do that. OK, so that's a stackable item. What about tradable? Well, actually, you know what? Let's make that this. So I've just turned on tradable for this item. And we'll do a whole talk later on about uh, trading, um, possibly as a blog post. But the, uh, the idea of trading is uh, we've set up a system in PlayFab where you can define a trade, and then you make that trade available to either a subset of players within the system. So maybe you only want to be able to trade it with you only want to set up the trade for a few players, or possibly one player. Or you can make it open so that any player in the system can claim that trade. We'll also be setting up a trade marketplace later on uh, as part of this, the obvious next step for this. And even further out is the intent of using this to create something more akin to an auction system. But for right now, we do have trading. It is available. Uh, if you have a need for trading, certainly uh, please come to our forums. We'd be happy to hear from you and help you to design out the right ways to work with that. If it's something where you really feel the conversation needs to be private because of intellectual property concerns or similar, feel free to email us at devrel, D-E-V-R-E-L, at playfab.com. OK, but yes, the tradable here then gives players the ability to trade the items between each other. So going back to the example of a game where you have version 1 has certain items, version 1.1 has more items, and then version 2 completely changes out the items that you have for your game. The items from version 1 and 1.1 of your game are no longer something that players can, can obtain through normal means. So suddenly those items become hugely valuable in your trading system and players can ask for quite a lot from it. So it's just uh, one of the, uh, the ways in which you can encourage more social interaction within your game. Okay. So that's consumables, stackables, tradables. All right, but now let's talk about one more thing, and that's bundles and containers. So I'm going to add one more item here to start. This is just going to be a basic bundle. I'm going to call it that. <clears throat> so the basic bundle here is a bundle of goods. And the idea of a bundle is that it's something that comes with other things as well. So when you think of a bundle, you might not necessarily want to call it a bundle. Maybe what you're calling it is it's uh, a knife, and maybe the knife automatically comes with a sheath. So what you do is you come in near the bundle, and you say, OK, I'm going to add an item to it. In this case, I'm just going to make the bundle come with a card. There we go. So I'm going to make it come with, actually, I'm going to make it come with three cards. OK, so we've just added an item to the bundle. And you know what? No, it's not a currency. In addition to the card, when you get this bundle, oops, I'm sorry, I have to say the wrong button. Um, oh, no, my bad, folks. I had hit the right button. I forgot the order it comes in. OK, so let's put that card back, three of them. And in addition to the card, you get maybe, let's say, 10 gold coins when you get this particular bundle. OK, so that's a bundle. But what about containers? So. I did that again. All right. So let's first add one more thing. And this item is, oh, I don't know. Let's call it the magic wand. And the magic wand is used to open chests. So the chests in your world are locked. And you're going to want a magic wand to open them. And when you use the magic wand, well, maybe the magic wand has three uses. Every, every magic wand has three uses. And it, so it can open three chests. Okay. What does that mean? Well, let's add a chest. Loot chest. So the loot chest contains a selection of items. If I can type, there we go. Uh, contains a loot drop. Okay, and it only has one use. So when you use the the uh, the container in question, when you open this container, it goes away, and the items that are in it are delivered. But what's in it? Well, let's add a little bit of everything. So we're going to add, maybe there's a card in it. Oops, I'm sorry. 
So there's always one card in it. And there's always, say, five gold coins. But what else is in it? Okay. Make sure I save that. Oops. Sorry. All right. Well, I'll fix that in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a drop table. So my table ID is going to be loot drop. Okay. So a drop table is where you define I'll check my catalog make sure I'm getting my names right. Oops. And of course, I got giant fingers and a touch screen computer. Okay. So, oh, I didn't save my items. My bad. All right. Well, we'll just use these three that we've, we've set up so far, and I'll re-add the others back in. Okay. Something, the health potion, and the experience boost. So in the drop table, what I'm going to do, I'm going to add in something, and maybe the weight on that is 100. And I add in, oh, let's say the, uh, now I'm, of course, blanking on what I had. Let me save that, check my catalog. Ah, health potion, right, thank you. So let's add in a health potion, if I can spell again. There we go. All right, and this also has a weight of 100. So it's equal chance, and you notice that the odds just changed automatically when I typed that in. If I wanted the health potion to be overwhelmingly something that I add in, I can increase the weight on it. And that obviously changes the odds on the fly automatically. So, But in this case, I'm just going to make it a 50-50 chance. OK, so we saved that out. Now we've got a loot drop table. And if I go back to my catalog, now I can add back in. Let me add in the, this is an important lesson for everyone. Always click Save Item whenever you're working in the catalog. OK, so let's say the uh, loot drop chest. There we go. Contains my treasure. Okay, and it has one use. Let's save that real quick so that we can also add the key. And the key was the magic wand. All right. So the magic wand is used to open chests. And I give it my usage count of three. Save that out. And again, you'll probably want to define prices for many of these items. Although you could just be using them as grants for actions taken in the game. But over here in the container, I add in, in this case, I'm just going to say it comes with, let's say, one experience boost and a little bit of gold. And now we can add the table. There's the loot drop. So I'm going to draw one time from the loot drop. So obviously, when I was talking earlier about the, uh, the collectible card games that are using our system, one of the things that you can do is you can define some pretty sophisticated sets of drop tables, which is what they've done. And then they created loot drops uh, in ch basically containers, which represent their uh, random card packs. So the random card pack, in their case, draws five draws, so quantity five, from the random drop table common cards. And maybe two from uncommon, and maybe one from rare. And in that way, they build up their own uh, card pack system for their games. But I also have my magic wand. So without the uh, uh, container on, this is just a bundle, so it's an item that comes with it. So I turn on container to make it a container. And until then, it's a key item, it can be opened as soon as the player has it. But if I enter my magic wand here, so now this container requires the magic wand to open. Without it, the player can't get to it at all. But once he does have the magic wand, he can open it. They both get decremented. When they reach zero, they're removed from the inventory. OK, so there you go. That is how you set up the various items. And let's just step back to the talk and see if I missed anything. Let's see. We did consumables, usage and time-based. We did stackables, talked about tradables, bundles as well, containers, and random drop tables. So there you go. Didn't miss a thing. OK. Custom data. <clears throat> so this has caused a little bit of confusion, so I want to be really clear about it. The, uh, the idea of custom data on the catalog level is that it defines global properties. So the, the idea there is that you define these properties for items in your catalog so that you can then change them at the catalog level and have them apply to all players across your entire game. 
They are not automatically copied into the item instances in the player inventory because then they wouldn't be modifiable at the global level. You wouldn't be able to just set them once. You'd have to set them on every single player. And that's not really something that's a, uh, an efficient operation. So instead, uh, it's defined globally. You can change it any time. You would use this for global things like stat requirements for usage of items or weapon strengths or anything else, really, which is something you want to be able to define at that level for all your items. At the item instance level, what you're defining are local properties for the item. So maybe if you have a procedurally defined item system, procedurally generated items, you'd want to define a bunch of properties on the local item because they are really unique to that item. Or maybe you want to provide override values for the global values coming from the catalog. Or maybe you're just defining enhancements to the item. So you, uh, as a course of gameplay, uh, add some effect to the item. So you add that as a property to the item so that you know that it, it glows or it's on fire or whatever else you need. Okay, finally stores. So only had a couple of little hiccups in the, in the catalog, so this is my opportunity to, to really mess things up once more. Here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and create a, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and create a store for you in our example here. So if we go over to stores, uh, new, there we go. Okay, so uh, you can define stores based on catalog. So as I said earlier, all your items go in the one catalog. And then when you want to subdivide them, you can create a store. So the store might be because you have a specific set of items for a character class that you want to present. Or in the case I'm going to show you, oops, holiday store. So maybe you have an upcoming uh, holiday event that you want to run. And during that holiday event, all the items in your catalog are going to have lower, prices lowered by 20%. So now I create the store. What happens here is automatically in our system, whenever you create a store, it adds in all the items that are defined in your catalog right off the bat. Now you'll notice I didn't define prices for most of the items, so you'll see here that they don't have prices defined. Now normally, you're going to define prices for most of the things in your catalog. However, uh, it's certainly possible to have items that don't have prices. An item that does not have a price in your catalog has no way for the player to get it apart from you doing a grant operation to put it directly into the player's inventory. So there is no way for the player to use any purchase operation to get it, which is very, very handy for you in certain circumstances. But in this case, uh, and I need to note what I'm doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and so I'm going to add a couple of prices. So I'm adding a price of, uh, let's say, 150 gold coins to the health potion. I'm not going to add anything to the experience boost. Uh, maybe I'm going to add 500 to the loot drop chest. Um, and sure, why not? For the magic wand, it's it's actually going to be relatively inexpensive, 250 compared to the chest. Okay, <clears throat> so what I've done here is I've added in prices in gold coins for these items. These items don't have prices in the catalog, but because they have prices in the store, this is something that while the store is active, you're able to actually make purchases. This is very handy if you have a situation where uh, you find that players are building up a large amount of a virtual currency in your game and not spending it, you might want to create a special event where you offer things for sale that you don't normally sell and offer them for a premium price in that virtual currency. And that will get people to, to spend that virtual currency on those items because they know they can't get it otherwise. Okay. Uh, one other convenience then is any item that does not have a price defined, there's Look down here in the lower right, you'll see it says remove empty. Okay, so if I click that, anything that doesn't have a price defined is just automatically removed from the store. And that's because you can't save the store until everything has a price, because the intent of a store is specifically that everything in it has a price. Okay, so we save the store up, and that store is now available for your game so that you can use it. And again, it's a, a discount holiday store. So we, over here, we took a 20% discount. It was one diamond was what the price was for, for the something. So obviously it's still one. 20% off the 100 gold coins, we get 80. And then uh, $1.99 real money, it's now $1.60 for this store. Okay. And it's actually that simple. Like I said, once you understand the, the full scope of how you can set up all the items in the catalog, the store is actually really quite straightforward. Okay. Looks like we did okay there. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. I, I'll talk you through, while I'm waiting to see if there are any questions, I'll talk you through the, uh, the resources that we have available. Um, 
So the, some of the things that I talked about over the course of this webinar, we've got our GitHub, and one of the, the handier components there for people who are doing things that, uh, where you want to set up some server authoritative uh, actions, but don't necessarily want, need to have a, a full custom game server being hosted yourself, is Cloud Script, and we've got our Cloud Script samples. Uh, the reward sample is the one that I was using in today's webinar, but there are others there, um, and there's also the basic sample, which is automatically added to all new games created in the PlayFab service. It shows you a number of the basics, including a, a simple hello world type of call, as well as setting user statistics and things like that. So it gives you some of the fundamentals of how to use CloudScript. Um, there's a tutorial available on our site, as well as the CloudScript webinar that I spoke about earlier. Uh, those are both things that you can use to, to learn a little bit more about how to use the CloudScript service and some of the more useful things that you can do with it. And then finally, we've got our blog, and within it, uh, I linked here to the, uh, the receipt validation, uh, and I apologize, it looks like I, my copy-paste operation failed. I will fix that for the version of this slide deck that we post online later, uh, but we have uh, blogs for both receipt validation, showing you how that process works throughout, as well as uh, a blog that talks about stores and coupons and a little bit more depth on each of those. Uh, and coupons, specifically, are a system that we have where you can generate a, a coupon, a code that a user can type in, which gives people the ability to then uh, get the item for free from your catalog. There's an API call for redeeming the coupon, and what you do is you just give players a, a, a window to type in their code, you make the call to us, we find the coupon, we validate it, we add the item to player inventory, and then we cancel the coupon so that it can't be reused. We will be expanding the coupon system later on to allow for infinite reuse coupons as well as uh, a specified count use so that one coupon ID could be used n number of times where you define that number, uh, as well as usage periods where you'll be able to generate coupons which are only valid for 24 hours or 30 days or whatever else you need. Uh, but with that, that's today's talk. Uh, please, again, feel free to uh, reach out to us on our forum site. That's the link there. It's community.playfab.com. Uh, you can also send questions to us via Facebook or Twitter. We've got the, the Twitter handle listed there. Uh, but with that, unless there are any questions, which it, it looks like we must have been pretty thorough because so far there's nothing. <laughs> um, I'll just give you folks another minute or so. The, uh, the store system in particular, uh, just backing up to talk a little bit more about the drop tables, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure to cover that in depth is because that is one of my favorite components of the system because it gives you the flexibility to do a wide range of things. In the case of the collectible card games, just to, to give you a little more info on that, uh, they've defined, think of it as this way, you define all your bottom level items. So you've got maybe three attributes, like earth, air, fire, and water for elements, and then you've got rarity common, uncommon, uh, rare, and legendary, maybe. So you, what you do is you define at the bottommost level one table, which is all of your fire, common, et cetera, et cetera, cards. And then another table, which is your water, common, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera cards. And so you define that uh, combinatoric, uh, the, or the, the lowest level combination of all of those, right? So you'd have a whole bunch of these bottom level ones, and then you could combine them to create your next layer up. So maybe you have a drop table, one up from there, which is uh, just common cards. So you, you've got all your elements, now you've got a common card. So the common card draw would be uh, the four tables below that, earth, air, fire, and water, common, and maybe you put equal chance on each, right? So you define them each with an equal weighting. So that you randomly draw one common card, and so on and so on, so that you can build it up until you get at the top level one random drop table which is drawing one common card of all types throughout your game and another which draws from all one one draw table which is any fire card regardless of of rarity but then within that you would also define your chances on the rarity so that you could define specifically the the commons would have a weighting of a thousand and then the uncommons of a hundred ten one right so that you're you're able to define and control that and then you update the drop tables over time as you find you know what balance you need for how many of the cards that you give out. Okay, we still don't have any questions, so I'm done. I'm gonna let everybody go. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, had a lot of fun talking through this. If you guys have any questions at all about our catalog system, again, feel free to let us know. 
and uh, enjoy. Looking forward to seeing what you guys build with it. All right. Thanks everybody for joining today.